Now we turn to the hard question, religious discrimination and reasonable accommodation. Now one of the major distinguishing characteristics of religious discrimination from the other types of discrimination is this notion of accommodation. And accommodation is important because when the Americans with Disabilities Act is passed, the ADA, the ADA actually imports these same accommodation concepts into the statute. And so the accommodation that you see in the ADA, as required by the ADA, arises out of the accommodation um, analysis used for religious discrimination. Now, what do we need to know about accommodation? Well, first of all, no, there's not an absolute prohibition against religious discrimination. If accommodating religion causes a hardship, an employer can discriminate on the basis of religion. And this is different from any of the other types of discrimination. There is an absolute prohibition against race or color discrimination. There is an absolute pro prohibition against sex discrimination. But when it comes to religious discrimination, an employer can discriminate if to not discriminate poses a hardship on the employer. There's no reasonable accommodation requirement for race or gender or color or national origin. So the accommodation concept places a duty to accommodate on both the employer and the employee. What a court or the EEOC will look for in these types of cases is, was there an interactive process? Did the parties attempt to reach an accommodation of the religious practice that is causing the conflict with the job? So both employer and employee have a duty to cooperate in finding this accommodation. How do we prove a claim of failure to accommodate? Once again, we start with the prima facie case. In order to establish failure to accommodate, the employee must first prove that she has a bona fide religious belief that conflicts with an employment requirement, that she informed the employer of this belief and requested an accommodation, and she was disciplined or discharged for failing to comply with the conflicting employment requirement. So in the event of an accommodation claim, the employee must establish that she needed accommodation, she had a sincerely held belief or practice, that she requested that from the employee, employer, and the employer failed to accommodate her belief. Now, an employer has defenses. So again, this that first element, proving the prima facie case, shifts the burden to the employer, just as with all the other burden shifting that we've talked about. So now the burden is on the employer to prove that it offered the employee a reasonable accommodation or that the accommodation that is sought cannot be accomplished without undue hardship. And we'll talk about undue hardship. What does it mean? Undue hardship is a very difficult concept to determine. We know that once an employer is made aware of a religious conflict, the employer has to make a good faith attempt to accommodate the conflict. So if there is a conflict, the employer cannot simply say, look, I hired you to work on Saturdays, and now you're telling me you can't work on Saturdays. We have to, I, you're terminated. Instead, the employer has to make an effort to accommodate the requirement. However, that effort is constrained by the concept of undue hardship, that if it is an undue hardship to accommodate the conflict, the employer doesn't have to do it. So an employer can discriminate against an employee for religious reasons if to not do so would cause the employer undue hardship. 
if no accommodation can be worked out without undue hardship on the part of the employer, the employer has fulfilled its Title VII duty to engage in this interactive process and therefore can take the adverse employment action regardless of the, um, the fact that it was based on religious belief or practice. Now, undue hardship is hard to determine, and there's no bright line that establishes what constitutes undue hardship. It's going to vary from situation to situation. We know that the accommodation uh, that the employee's request uh, must be more than simply an inconvenience to the employer. It must be more than a mere inconvenience. Instead, it must present an actual hardship. So how do we decide what is undue hardship? Well, we look at a number of factors, and again, these are non-exclusive. There could be other factors to take place, but these are the kinds of things that the employer uh, that a court or the EEOC would look at. And first we look at the nature of the employer's workplace. What kind of workplace is it? Is it a large multinational uh, corporation? Or is it a small mom and pop type business? What's the nature of the workplace? What kind of job is it that needs accommodation? Is it a job where I require you to be there on uh, on Saturdays because I'm only open on Saturdays or most of my customers come in on Saturdays? Or is it a job where being there on a particular day doesn't really matter? So the type of job needing accommodation. The cost is a huge factor, of course. If you can establish that the accommodation costs too much, that's enough to establish undue hardship. But again, we're going to measure it in light of this particular employer in terms of how much cost that employer can bear. We look at the willingness of other employees to assist in the accommodation. So again, if you come to me and you say, I am, uh, I've joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church and we are, um, we are prevented from working on the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Therefore, I need Saturdays off. Well, if I can find another employee who's willing to work that and willing to trade, then that's not an undue hardship. If I have no other employees that are willing to make that change, then it may be undue hardship. Can you transfer the employee? What would be the effects of the transfer? This is, this is really important, this one. What, what's done by other employers? What do other similarly situated employers do? Because if other employers can do it, you're probably going to be required to do it as well. How many employees are available for accommodation? Meaning, if everyone is requesting a special accommodation and virtually no one is not requesting that, that's going to be going to the factor. Union. Is there a burden of accommodation on the union? Oftentimes in um, facilities, a union facility, the, um, the most senior uh, workers there get the best schedules. If instead of the, uh, the union rules applying, I'm required to give a, 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 a less senior person a Saturday off, that's a burden on the union. Now, when it comes to accommodation, the employee's obligation to cooperate does not start until the employer shows it has taken some initial step. So once the employer is put on notice of the conflict, once there has been a request for an accommodation, or the employer knows that there's a conflict, the employer must do something, must take some initial step some attempt to compromise. The employee then must assist in the attempted accommodation. What a court will look at or what an agency will look at is, was there this interactive process between the parties? In this case, Wilson v. U.S. West Communications, it involved a, um, a woman 
who worked for U.S. West, Miss Wilson, and she um, she had recently taken to working to wearing a big anti-abortion button uh, on her on her dress at work or on her outfit. And the anti-abortion button was actually a picture of an aborted fetus, a very graphic, very uh, uh, disturbing image, and she took to wearing that on her dress. Her manager said, you can't wear that, that upsets people. However, and she said, well, this is my religious belief. I must, um, I must do what my religious belief says, and my religious belief is based on the idea of opposition to abortion. So the company says, okay, you can wear the button as long as you're in your cubicle. Wear your button. But if you leave your cubicle, you have to take the button off because that offends other employees, not because of the abortion, but simply because it's a very graphic image uh, being displayed on your outfit. And Miss Wilson says, no, I, my, my religion requires me to wear the button all the time, and if I take it off, then I'm not following my religious belief. So in this case, how, so she files a lawsuit after U.S. West terminates her for failure to take off the button. And in this case, the court says, look, there was an accommodation offered. U.S. West offered her accommodation. Miss Wilson, however, drew a line in the sand and said, I must be allowed to wear the button no matter what. She did not engage in the interactive process and therefore decision in favor of the employer. Another case came up involving Costco, the Costco, the, the uh, discount chain retailer, and Miss Cloutier, who was a, um, a cashier at Costco. And Miss Cloutier had a pierced eyebrow, and Costco had a rule that the only piercings you could have were in your ears, and um, therefore no eyebrow rings were permitted. Well, Ms. Cloutier says, I am a member of the World Church of Body Modification, and therefore I must wear my um, piercings for the whole world to see. Costco says, okay, you can have a pierced eyebrow, but you must cover it up with a Band-Aid. The, the, Ms. Cloutier says, no, I'm not going to cover it up. This is my religious belief. And once again, the court sides with Costco, not on the basis that the World Church of Body Modification wasn't a sincerely held belief, but instead on the fact that Ms. Cloutier failed to cooperate with the, um, with the attempt to accommodate her, uh, her desire to wear an eyebrow piercing. So um, again, the employee has a duty to participate in this interactive process. If accommodation is not possible, the employer can then discriminate against the employee on the basis of religion. The problem with these cases is that every case is fact dependent and it's hard to make a general rule. We know that an employer doesn't have to accommodate everything an employee wishes to do simply because it's related to the employee's religion. Uh, sorry. Let me start all over on this one. If accommodation is not possible, the employer can discriminate against the employee on the basis of religion. But this is very difficult because every case is fact dependent and it's hard to make a general rule. An employer doesn't have to accommodate everything an employee wishes to do simply because it's related to the employer's religion. However, if accommodation is possible, the employer should accommodate um, the religious belief. As we will see in the next section, there were a number of cases in which courts have routinely sided with employees about religious discrimination claims.